SIMPOW stands for the Simulation Alliance of Pennsylvania, Ohio, and West Virginia, a loose alliance of healthcare simulation professionals that provides a forum and network for healthcare educators to enhance the curricula through simulation. This educational session was recorded at the SIMPOW gathering, which took place on November 16, 2018 at Pocket Nurse, a company whose vision is to improve educational experiences and outcomes by providing simulation and medical supply solutions. Simulated patients, standardized patients, simulators. Um, I'm a member of ASPE, which is the Association of Standardized Patient Educators, so their official term is standardized patient. But you'll hear other disciplines use other, other terms. Um, sometimes mannequins are referred to as simulators or human simulators, so just get clear on what it is that you're talking about, whether it's actual humans or whether it's mannequins. Oh, hello. So the topics that we're going to go over today are what scenarios should you choose when you're considering adding a standardized patient simulation to your center or to your curriculum? So how do you choose those? How do you find standardized patients? How do you cast them? Where do you look for them? And what do you do for training them? We're getting closer. So and how do you train them? Are we there? Yeah. Fabulous. Yep. So there are some simulations that seem fairly obvious for standardized patients. For example, we have a bunch of our students gathered around listening to heart and lung sounds. Obviously on mannequins, heart and lung sounds can be programmed, pre-programmed, changed easily. How many of you are in centers where you have mannequins? Does everybody have mannequins available? OK, great. So you're probably fairly familiar with the capabilities of them, what they can do. Um, if you're going to do CPR, if you're going to do procedures like insert NG tubes, insert Foley catheters, most standardized patients really are not into that. You don't want to use your mannequin for that kind of thing. That said, there are a lot of things that we can do that can be overlays, extra equipment um, that, that we can use with standardized patients. For example, with vital signs, sometimes the equipment can be expensive. There are special stethoscopes. Um, overlays that can be purchased that can actually be programmed with vital signs um, like, a, like a blood pressure cuff, programmable blood pressure cuffs, um, stethoscopes that are programmable so they can be used on standardized patients for things like vital signs, heart and lung sounds. Yeah, I haven't found an SP that wants me to put a tube in them yet. So we found ways to mimic that. So scenarios that are really good for for standardized patients are, are where uh, communication is important, where you want to see facial expression, where you want to have tone of voice, where you want to have um, movement, where the mannequins are certainly not going to be able to give you hand grasps, that kind of thing, emotions, and some symptom portrayal. For example, if the standardized patient or if the scenario calls for a patient having a stroke, CVA, you can speak over the microphone to tell the student hand grasps are strong or hand grasps are weaker on the right, but you can have a standard teach train a standardized patient to actually do that. So one of the things that we've actually done is started converting some of our mannequin simulations into standardized patient simulations. Thank you. Dana's been pivotal in helping to helping to make those changes and rewrite the mannequin scripts. The, one of the first ones that we're choosing are ones where communication is absolutely essential. The one that we finally did this week um, was our mannequin simulation we've been doing for years for a patient that's having a CVA. And we, trans we changed that over to a mannequin simulation, and the standardized patient can then be weaker on one side. In fact, I, asked, I, I looked for casting for people that could actually raise one eyebrow instead of both eyebrows at the same time, and I actually found three people, three women that could do that. So they could raise one eyebrow, so that's that's their strong side, and whichever eyebrow they couldn't raise, that was going to be their weaker side in total. So that was how we, how we chose. If there's movement, uh, facial expression, communication, their speech was slurred, um, and that's really easy to do with a standardized patient. So that was ripe for changing over to SPs. We do use standardized patients for um, pretty much every course that is a clinical except for PEDS, and I'll talk about PEDS in a little bit. So for example, in OB, we do use standardized patient. What she, she is not actually pregnant, but it was so convincing what we did that the uh, instructor actually said, how did you find three women that were seven months pregnant? 
what this, I know, we're that good. What this actually is, is a pair of Spanx and a half inflated beach ball. And that's, that's, I know, it's so simple. And thank, we thank uh, Petraea Anderson from the University of Sunshine Coast in Australia. She is the Spanx queen. She's responsible for some of these low cost, um, high, high believability kinds of things. Um, we also have a patient in the bed on the left. This is a simulation which is interesting because of the communication or lack thereof. This patient is traked, so they can't speak. So the students have to figure out how to communicate with the patient who, excuse me, who is not verbal. And we mimic that by simply cutting off the back of a trach tube. And then that's applied to the patient's, to the patient's neck with a piece of gauze. It's, it's that simple. And somebody that works with us, her husband owns a hardware store and had a really good saw that cut that right off. Um, I'm going to have some moulage in here. So that's coming up next. Hopefully we don't have any queasy stomachs. But all, everything that you're going to see is moulage. It's not real injuries or anything like that. So when you're choosing, again, when you're choosing your, your scenario, one of the ones on, on the, your left is a psych scenario, but it's an adolescent girl who's been cutting, doing self-harm. So we moulage that. And she can really express mood far better than a mannequin can. Mannequins are really hard. hard it's hard to convince people that a mannequin is doing that, that expression when you're in a psych simulation. Um, and on the left-hand side, we have a nurse practitioner program. They use standardized patients for all of their diagnostics. So this is a patient who the story is that she fell. Her hand went through a wooden box. So she has a fracture where the bruise is and an abrasion going up her arm. So we can, actually, the, the DNP professor is kind enough to choose moulage-heavy simulations because she knows it's fun to do. Um, and it's also something that can be easily reproducible on multiple standardized patients if we need to. And by the way, if you have any questions along the way, please stop me. Please raise your hand and ask. Again, when you're choosing scenarios, standardized patients are really not into this kind of thing. So one thing that you can do is do a hybrid simulation. By that, you get your task trainers out, you put them next to the SP, or you trade the SP out with the, with the, the body if you need to do CPR, you put a mannequin in. There are simulations where you have an SP that begins, starts describing chest pain, they go unresponsive, you take a time out, Either go to a different room, move the SP out, move the mannequin in, resuscitate the mannequin, and then you can actually put the SP back in. Another way to do it is with the overlays that I talked about. We've actually had some simulations where, and I'll show you the next picture, where we have a task trainer next to or attached to the standardized patient. And the standardized patient is going to react as if the procedure is being done to them, even if it's not attached to them. And it's surprisingly believable. Even if they're, the students are working on a suture pad on the table next to them, the patient is still wincing if they're, if they're having an injection or having sutures put in. And here is an example. Now this is, again, this is all moulaged. So this was, what's on this woman's arm was, was supposed to be um, a shard of glass. Her arm went through a window. The putty on her arm that the piece of plastic is actually embedded into is Vaseline, cornstarch, and cocoa powder, and that's it. It's inexpensive, it's simple, and it's, it actually, as her skin warms it, it molds to her skin and takes on her skin texture. And you can see on the left next to it, on her other arm we had this suture pad uh, ace wrapped onto her arm, and they did the procedure on that side. Because they weren't going to actually stitch up the putty, it wasn't going to work. Um, and the students found it re re really pretty believable. Their, their evaluations reflected that they really, they bought it. It felt pretty realistic. And they know they're working on a suture pad. Yep, I covered that. So, when you're going to choose your scenario, there are going to be a couple of things that you want to consider. What course do you want to put your scenario in? Where do you want to use your standardized patient? Who are the learners that you want to put into the room? Who are the learners that need to work on communication, that need to understand facial expression, that need to work on how to ask questions? Because standardized patients can moderate their response based on the skill of the learner. So if you have a brand new nursing student who doesn't have that elevator speech down, the SP can actually be trained to give more information. If it's a DNP student in psych that's about to graduate, Chances are it's going, they're going to have to be, they're going to need to be more skilled. 
So you can add in a scenario where the SP is trained to make it harder to give up more information. Um, what are your objectives? What do you want to get out of this simulation? And who is your patient going to be? One thing that you might want to actually do is do what we did and convert a uh, mannequin simulation into a standardized patient simulation. You already know the objectives. The basic simulation is already written. You might have all the vital signs and everything programmed into your software that's in the, in the control room. You already know what you want out of that simulation. So you have it mm, three quarters written. You just have to convert it into standardized patient. That might be one easy way to go instead of starting from scratch. And there's nothing wrong with starting from scratch either to create something that you don't have yet. All right. So when you're recruiting potential standardized patients, there's a couple of things that are important to consider. One of the first things to think about is who's going to be available to you? It is um, unwise to cast, try to cast a huge simulation where you need multiple standardized patients for your first one, especially if you need men between the ages of, say, 30 and 50. There's a whole bunch of people that have day jobs out there. There are people that are available. We can find them, but the easiest group to cast, I've found, and usually at ASPE meetings, this is what we talk about, where do you find people, is people that are in retirement age. You can find people in their 60s that are retired that look a little bit younger, and that's something to consider, <clears throat> but it may be easiest for you to cast somebody that's retired. They're more available, they have flexible schedules, um, and they're also, they've, I mean, all the SPs that I work with love what they do because they're contributing to health care. Um, and standardized patients, especially people that are retired, just love making a contribution to nursing. Um, consider gender. Women are sometimes easier to find in, in all age groups than men. Um, do you need to find a specific ethnicity? When I go to ASPE meetings, this is another thing that we talk about. So on the East Coast and the West Coast, like the extremes, by the oceans, it's easier to find multiple ethnicities. In the interior of the United States, it's a little bit harder. So think about what's most important in your scenario and how hard or easy is it going to be fine depending upon the size of the town that you live in. Um, other needs, do they need to speak a foreign language? Do they have acting experience? Do they have improbability? Uh, by improv, I mean improvisation. So the, the people that I, that I work with as standardized patients, some of them are trained actors, but many of them are not. Some of them have done community theater, but not all of them. Some of them retired, heard about this, thought it was really cool, and they got some training, and they're marvelous at it. They have a natural acting ability. But you need to make sure that they have the ability to improvise. That's very important. Um, the other thing that you can do is choose a scenario where age doesn't matter. In our diagnostics class, for example, it doesn't matter what age they are to have a fracture. So our nurse practitioner will say, um, choose whoever you want, let me know who you have. So I find whoever is available, who I know can do a good job and is available all day. And then I tell her, I found somebody in their 30s. I found an older man in his, uh, that's around 70. And she'll write the scenario or make it a scenario where the age really doesn't make a difference. When you're, when you're searching for standardized patients, where on earth do you find them? One way, when we first started our program, we actually started using people's mothers and sisters and husbands, people that we found on campus. Um, they were great. and it was also, if they were people that were recognizable to the students, it decreases the fidelity of your simulation. So our campus is just big enough that we actually sent out an email to the entire staff and faculty of the university. I probably had about 12 people respond, and a couple of those folks I've actually used. They aren't people that are in classes that are where our students would recognize them. They're in other departments. So that's actually a half-decent place. And we actually were able to pay them. They were kind of surprised. They were like, oh, I was going to do this for volunteer. So there may be people on your campus or in your area that are willing to volunteer uh, to take just, just because they want to be a contribution to the students as part of their jobs anyway. They just like being a contribution to students. Um, we have used relatives. We had the dean's mom come in. One of, the first, one of the first people we ever used was the dean's mom. She's awesome. She's hilarious. Um, you can also contact church groups, retirement groups, any other community group that you can think of in, in, in where you live. Uh, it may take some explaining. Most people that I run into have never heard of standardized patients. Their reference is often Kramer from Seinfeld. There was one scenario where he was actually a standardized patient, 
And if anybody has any reference point, that's the one. We haven't done that scenario, but that's a possibility. So um, I've actually contacted local community theaters to see if anybody's interested. I've hired a couple of, I've cast a couple of standardized patients from our commu local community theater groups. We have a college theater department, and we've used college theater students. Um, there are casting websites on social media. Um, I prefer to use people that are local, that are known to me, that are referred to me, if at all possible. Just this past spring and summer, I started using a casting website. Of, it's a Facebook group that's actually a legit Pittsburgh casting um, association. And I had probably 15 or 20 people respond. And out of that, I found three people that I could actually use. So it's a lot of work um, for a little bit of payoff. But I also found two, three men that were in their late 20s, which was wonderful, because that, those were harder to cast. Um, I also use other standardized patients. Once your program's established, I use other standardized patients to make referrals because they know who they work with and they know who, who to refer. They're, they're wonderful for that. Um, let me see if there's anything else in my notes. Oh, I know. I wanted to tell you why I cast actors and not people in healthcare. I want somebody that can act, that can portray a character convincingly. So I prefer to hire actors so they can do that portrayal. I tend not to hire people in healthcare for several reasons. Sometimes, and if, if they are, if they're retired nurses or retired doctors, whatever, that's fine. But you have to make sure that they aren't leading the student. So for example, if you have a nurse practitioner student who is learning how to do a physical exam head to toe, you don't want somebody that knows what they're going to be doing and starts moving their body in ways before they're told. They have to wait for the student to direct them. Raise your arm, turn over, roll to your side, will you sit up please? And sometimes people in healthcare know what's going to happen and they start doing it automatically. The other reason is, and I'm going to go over feedback in a few minutes. In feedback, I want the patient perspective. You'll have educators and facilitators that are watching the student and giving them content feedback for how to perform better. But I also want a layperson's perspective. And SPs are perfect for that. They don't have medical, most of them don't have medical background. So they can actually give feedback on, this is what it was like to be your patient and to have you as my nurse, and giving that perspective. <clears throat> Here is the, the argument for why I prefer not to use our professors. Several reasons. There's, there's varying acting ability. Um, and also, sometimes it's, it can be intimidating for a student to sit across, across from their professor. Even if they have a great relationship with you, there's still that, okay, first of all, I recognize your face, I know who you are, so it's sort of this is harder. And also, there can be an intimidation factor. They know they're being watched if they were in the control room, but that wall creates a separation that sometimes makes students feel more comfortable. Um, make sure you're choosing people who are reliable, if at all possible. Make sure they have good transportation. Some of the stuff is just really simple. There was somebody that emailed me and wanted to work for me. We're in Moon Township. They lived across the city, and they had to get three buses to, to get to us. Um, and it just wasn't going to work. Um, and consider if you're going to try to pay them or if you want to look for volunteers first. We did get grant money uh, that, that funded our standardized patient program for the first two years, which was awesome. Um, and if you can get that, go for it. And that's not always a possibility. You may want to start with volunteers just to get it rolling and see if you really want to work to expand it. What kind of payment scale might you do? I figured that was going to come up. Um, in Pittsburgh, standardized patients are paid between $15 and $20 an hour, uh, depending upon uh, some places do a scale based on their experience. Some do a flat fee. I mean, your program gets, you get to decide how you're going to run it. In bigger cities, they often will earn a little bit more. Um, right. They don't get a grade for it. Usually they have, uh, they're allowed to actually, allowed to miss, uh-oh, allowed to miss a couple of classes. Um, 
and they actually get signed off. Like sometimes I'll have to sign a piece of paper that said they were actually doing what, I, what they said they were going to go do, so they have an excuse to miss class. There are some, um, there are some universities that actually have acting for health as a credit course, and they're required to act in the standardized patient program. So it helps to feed actors into the SP program for the health for healthcare, and it's providing credit. So we don't do that. Um, we have our, basically, it's a small theater program, and they're, they're making it a theater minor. There's no theater major anymore. Um, but different universities run it differently. depends on the size of the university. Uh, what else? Yes? Right. With our, with our program, it actually began with somebody, the theater professor was actually working at Pitt as a standardized patient. So he was able to actually provide some of the training. Then we created a liaison with a theater uh, upper level student or graduate student, and that liaison was responsible for helping to, to train the standardized patients. At this point, because the, the theater program is shrinking, um, I've had to do more of the training, but there's also less call because of shifting professors and what they want to do. Um, fewer, fewer people that I need to train. And if I'm training an adult, um, a, new, a new SP as an adult, I can, I, just call the, I can call the theater department, tell them I'm having a training, and ask them to join. Gee, and I will, I will tell you, um, just to share with you, I tried writing a grant, an internal grant at our school, and just because I didn't want to write a grant, I wrote a letter to the president of the school and said, I Mm -hmm. in roles and in jobs to yep. provide service to them. So yep. it's another revenue stream for the student prospectively as they're starting the path with the life. Yep. Thank you very much. Um, when, you're, when it's coming down to actually finding your standardized patients, um, you may need to, I mentioned, most people don't know who standardized patients are. So you may need to actually go to these groups and do a presentation, talk about what you're up to, and explain what it is that standardized patients do, what they are, what their skills need, what their skills need to be. Um, I've actually, every once in a while, I have a, I have a work Facebook page, and I'll actually post, and I'll say, well, I need standardized patients. Does anybody know of any groups I can go to, church groups, anybody I can talk to that might be interested? Every once in a while, I'll get a feeler back from that. Um, what else on that? I usually cast by email. Um, I know I know who who is qualified and who has done the simulations before. If I can get them back, I'll absolutely get them back. What else? Yep, I think that's it for that one. When you're planning to um, go ahead and cast, you're ready to find your standardized patient. Make sure that you're clear to communicate to them because they'll have some questions for you. Get clear on your script. You should have your script ready to go. The objective should be ready to go. What their call time is, like when do you want them to arrive and when will they be finished? What kind of role requirements are there? What's actually going to happen in the simulation? What kind of role are they going to be portraying? For example, that, the young girl that has the, the cutting, um, I want to make sure that my SP, and in this case her father, we just did this last night, um, that her father is aware and her, or their guardian, whatever, is aware of what the student's going to be, what the actor is going to be doing, especially if they're younger age. But in any case, every SP should know what they're signing up for. So I actually sent a picture of that moulage to the actor, she's 14 years old, and to her father, and explained what the scenario was. I even sent the script. I usually send it about two weeks out. I sent the script early so they could have an idea of the kind of emotional expression, what this character had going on, because she's, she's on the dark side. She's depressed and she's anxious and she's having a lot of physical symptoms. Um, they were, she's a professional actor, 
she's, um, she's got a card. She's a, a union member. And she actually, uh, her father, she said she was excited. And she did a great job last night. But I want to make sure that my SPs are prepared. Um, consider also how many SPs you're going to need. If you have something happen where, like weather, weather happens, that happened yesterday, um, you're going to want somebody in the room, if you're, especially if you're running all day, uh, a backup and time for breaks. Um, I will not ask my standardized patients to run eight hours straight. It's exhausting and it's too much. So I make sure breaks are built in and that we have somebody for backups in case there's a no-show and also for breaks for rotating people in and out. Make sure you tell them what they need to wear. Um, we have all of our standardized patients wear shorts, women wear sports bras, and I make sure I tell them if they're going to have to have a physical exam or not. So they know, again, they know what they're signing up for. Um, we have students, we t make sure you're orienting your students, too, to standardized patients. Are they allowed to lower the gown? Um, a lot of students, every once in a while, a student will come out and say, I didn't know if I was allowed to do that or not. So we, we talk with our standardized patients. Yes, they're allowed to. They can lower the gown. The patient's covered. They have shorts. You know, we tell them what they are and are not allowed to assess. And in our facility, we treat bras, um, uh, sports bras, as if they're skin. So we don't have you know, putting their, their things under their stethoscopes underneath. I also make sure that, that our SPs are prepared for safety. We've never had to use this, but I always tell our SPs it is our policy that if anything is ever happening where you feel uncomfortable, unsafe, you as a standardized patient can stop the simulation. I make sure students know that, but we also tell the SP, you're not here for, for, to sacrifice yourself, so you get to call it an out, a timeout if you need, need a release, if you need them to stop whatever it is that they're doing. <clears throat> So make sure that your script contains objectives. And when I send the patient's scripts, the SP scripts, I send them the entire script. They know who the learners are. They know who, what the course objectives are. They have their character description. They know the emotional intensity that they're going to be portraying. And they know, and we'll talk a little bit about details versus, versus improvisation. Um, and I, talked, I talked already about the level of the, level of the learner. Talk, tell your patients the length of each session so they know how long they're going to be in the room. Are they going to be required to give feedback or not? Um, there, it's important that you train your standardized patients not to improvise in ways that are distracting. Um, you're going to need to give them, and I'll show you a scale that I use for emotional portrayal. Make sure that you're telling them how intense or how easy they need to be. Should they really be hard to, to extract information out of? And what level of emotional portrayal? Patient has anxiety, depression, they're in pain, they're angry. How does your standardized patient know how much intensity to portray? A little bit more about, about actors and drama. Actors are really creative people in my experience, and they love to show how good they are. What I w need to caution them against is taking the simulation off the rails. So there, if there's something that's not written into the script, it's, it's because it's a detail that doesn't matter. When I write scripts, I write in, in details that are essential to the patient. Are they a smoker? Do they have a past history of something? What medications are they on? What are their symptoms like? What I don't write in is what's their favorite TV show or do they have a pet if it doesn't matter. But you need to train your standardized patients if, to, to give neutral answers to questions that aren't written into the script. For example, do you have a pet if it's not written in? Do you have a pet? Yes, I have a cat. Is the whole different answer than a really creative actor that says, oh, yeah, I have 30 snakes and they, they're free range in the house. Like, that's an entirely different, like, that's going to take it somewhere else. So make sure you're training your standardized patients about the objectives and train them not to go too wild into improv. All right, this is a copy of one of the mood scales. This one is for anxiety. Um, and I started, I learned this, this at ASPE, the Associated Standardized Patient Educators Conference. And they did this for training to give and the, the reason we use the word standardized is so if you're using multiple people in the same role, that they're all portraying it as, as close as humanly possible to the same. So, for example, with this one, it describes facial expression, body language, and what they might say and how they might say it, language. So there's a 1, a 5, and a 10. 
we might tell this S the SP, you're playing this one at about a 4 to a 5. So everybody's getting the same descriptors. The other thing that I've started writing in is the opening line, so that every SP starts in the same place. When you're doing training, you probably are going to want to train your SPs how to give feedback. Feedback needs to be really concise so the learner can take it in. One of the first models that we start with, some people like this and some don't, it's the when you did this, I felt that model. It's really having the SP explain how they felt. So an example might be the SP might say to the learner, when, when you walked in and, and cleaned your hands before you shook my hand, I felt like I was cared for. When you were sitting there looking at your clipboard instead of looking at me, I felt kind of distanced from you. It's hard for the student to refute the SP's feelings, and it's giving them a behavior that can be changed. Some programs are into what-if feedback, and a lot of students will say, well, if I would have done this, what would it have been like? I'm okay with that if the SP is comfortable doing that. It's fine with me if they say how they probably would have felt. Um, some places don't like to do what-ifs, but I'm fine with it. I also teach our students to um, guide the learner questions. So we, we tell the students, when you go in to talk to your standardized patient, have a question in mind. It, don't just walk in and say, so how did I do? It's really harder for your SP to give that information. It really helps if they can specifically say, do you remember when I walked in and said that? Did that go okay? Was that okay with you? Or you know, was it okay that I, that I did this when I touched you and gave the exam? That really helps to guide the SP to give very specific feedback. A great resource for you all is the Association of Standardized Patient Educators. If you type in ASPE, you're going to get the American Society of Plumbing Engineers. Great people, that's not who you want. So you're going to type in ASPeducators.org. They're a wonderful resource. They have lots of information on there. And last year they came out with their new standard, uh, standards of best practice. Let me click this slide over. So, and it was published in Advances in Simulation. So if you actually type in ASPE standards of best practice and put in Advances in Simulation, you'll find them. They've helped to guide our policies. And what's really cool is they reinforced a lot of the policies that we already had in place. That made me happy. So I didn't have to do too much rewriting. Yes, Dana. Um, a, a graduate student started our program as, this is a great question, thank you. A graduate student started this as her graduate project, so it actually took her a number of months. But she was also applying for a grant. She was researching standardized patients. And this was, what, seven or eight years ago, so there was much less information, especially in nursing. Um, medical schools tend to use standardized patients differently. They tend to use them for physical assessment, uh, for training, for a lot of communication. Pharmacies use them. EMTs, e EMTs use them. Um, nursing uses them, I think, in a little more broadly. Um, in medical schools, standardized patients are actually trained to do the evaluation um, of the physical exam. So the SPs actually have to learn how to do a 46-point head-to-toe exam and be able to perform that exam before they're allowed to observe a student doing it on them and scoring them. But for us, it depends on um, what we wanted to choose. It took her actually a couple of months, I think, from start to finish by the time she did all the research, looking into standardized patients and that kind of thing. It's not something where you just want to throw a person in the bed. We just don't do that. That's bad practice. Um, I did bring one thing with me for use with our standardized patients. It's an IV diverter. We used to do it at a deal where there was an injection that the patient was supposed to get an IV med. Obviously, we're not going to give that to the patient. So we invented a little thing where you have the IV, you cut off the catheter that's going to go into the patient's body, you attach a stopcock to it, and turn it off to the patient. This is your injection port, so the students can actually inject this. So it's attached to the, it's attached to the patient's body. Sometimes we'll put a little dot of fake blood on there, so it's really compelling. Um, attach that on there. A student injects into here. Stopcock is off to the patient, so it goes in here and then goes into a drainage bag, which is either tucked under the pad or put on the floor. And we orient the students to this so they don't think we're trying to trick them, but we've thrown an IV bag on the floor and they have to catch it. So we orient them to the environment, so this is one of the, just one of the devices that we use to attach the standardized patients so the patient can actually watch what's happening and react to it. What else? Anything else?
Yes, sir. Right. We do it in the pre-brief, just before they go into the room. They'll ask, is this a standardized patient? And we actually have it written into our lesson plans to remind us to orient the students to standardized patients. Um, we do take them into the room to do room orientation. In that case, the, the SP will go into neutral. By that, I mean either they're reading, they're sleeping, or they're just kind of looking off into the corner. So they're in the room. They can see all of the equipment that's attached to the SP. Um, so does that answer? Yep. Anything else? We good? Yes, sir. That's why I send out the script and what's happening beforehand. Um, I've never had a standardized patient stop the scenario because they're uncomfortable. Um, I've had several patients, several SPs on my list who don't want to be involved with physical assessment. Some of them don't under, don't want to do intimate partner violence. Um, some of them don't want to do depression or don't want to do depression for more than one day. So I make sure that I send out that information beforehand so they can accept or decline before they even get in the door. Thanks. What else? We good? A hush has fallen over the room. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. You're welcome. For more from SimPow and other Pocket Nurse educational sessions, please subscribe to our YouTube page and subscribe to our blog at simtalkblog.com.